I would like to welcome Julia Hartz, the CEO of Eventbrite, to our virtual stage. Julia, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So it's been quite a few months for your business, obviously. So let's just, you know, get right to it. I mean, obviously, live events have taken quite a hit as a result of COVID. I'd love to kind of talk about uh, your business to start out with. I mean, I believe your revenue was hit 90% in the second quarter. Can you just talk a little bit about how you've had to pivot your strategy as a result of all of this? Sure. I mean, you're right. The last six months have been truly defining for the company. Eventbrite was founded in 2006 by myself, my husband, Kevin Hartz, and Renaud Visage. And, you know, we founded Eventbrite on the basis of democratizing ticketing to enable any event creator to be successful. And it's really built on the basis of freedom of assembly. So over the past 14 years prior to COVID, you know, freedom of assembly has been something that I think in a way we've taken for granted. It's been part of our enduring mission, but also not something that we had imagined really, even in the worst case scenario would be, um, you know, challenged. And here we are. So I'd say that the, the chief lesson that I've learned through this experience is, you know, to build your strategy for the worst case scenario and to um, really think about sort of what are the fundamental building blocks that you're putting into place as you build your startup or your small scaling business. Because the reason why I'm sitting here today and Eventbrite is in a truly remarkably strong position is because of the decisions we made, you know, the decade prior to COVID hitting. So for us, the pivoting has been more of a natural acceleration of what we already knew was unique in our business, which is our self-service ethos. So everything we do is built to empower event producers to be successful on the platform without needing any human help. And the second thing is to focus on the event producers themselves, the creators. In 2019, we powered a million creators who produced 4.7 4.7 million events. So we have gone laser, laser focused on these content creators, and we've helped them pivot their businesses into new formats during this, you know, it, totally intense crisis for the events industry. So maybe let's back up a little bit. Maybe let's let's go back to, I mean, February. Maybe you tell me like. When was it that you saw, okay, we're really going to have to rethink things. We're going to have to go to that plan B. What do we do? Maybe take me through, us through that process. Yeah, one of my uh, mentors uh, talked about the lockbox plan uh, right after we went public in 2018. And I thought he was pretty paranoid. And I'm really grateful to him for giving me that talk because uh, it was very early March, the first week of March, when I realized that we would need to open the lockbox. And that was really for us the um, you know, realization that you know being at the tip of the spear, so the first affected industry, not the only affected industry, has its advantages. Uh, you know, I think you'll find that throughout this story, I see opportunities in every single threat, in every single worst case scenario. And so the um, opportunity that we had in the midst of the very early days of COVID was, what would we do if we could do it all over again? And what, what would we reset? How would we lean into the strongest parts of our business or the things that make us unique? What, what are we best at? And that actually allowed us to focus on something that wasn't just the catastrophe of the crisis, but in parallel, we also had to be command and controlling the crisis itself. So that meant that immediately we needed to, to think about our people. How would we set them up for success in this you know, world where we all shifted to work from home? Uh, what felt like in a heartbeat, certainly us with kids um, had that experience in, in mid-March when kids were sent home from school. So there was a big shift in how we were going to work. And then it was immediately, how are we going to help our our customers, our creators survive this moment, um, both through, you know, better communication tools, product, 
and our own ability to connect them with things like federal relief faster and more reliably. Um, so it's a blur, but but really when I look back, we were able to move fast. We you know saw the first impact in early March. By April, we had downsized to our company by 45% which was an unthinkable and unimaginable act and, and that we needed to take. And by May, we had raised 225 million in capital to ensure that we would have the runway to continue to go through this crisis. So I'm really, I'm really proud of how quickly we moved, but I think it was two things. One, having that, knowing who we were and having that lockbox plan, and two, just completely focusing on the people who mattered the most, which were our brightlings and our creators. And can you talk a little bit about what you like, what new things you started to offer them given the different yeah. environment? Sure. So immediately we saw that our platform is ubiquitous and well, we know that our platform is ubiquitous in live experiences. And so when we uh, when we really stepped into this, we knew that one way that creators would be pivoting their business was by bringing their events online. So, you know, as we started to see the CDC recommend um, no gatherings more than, you know, 50 people than more than 10 people, um, you know, that was really a sobering moment. And yet we, we immediately started to see the rise of online events on the platform. So these aren't just events that, you know, occurred to the creators because of COVID. These are events that existed prior to COVID. So things like the Rockstar Beer Festival that's been um, going on since 2011, they started ship, shipping out their craft beer and then hosting an online beer and music festival with smaller groups. Or one of my favorites, Murray's Cheese, which is actually in, in New York, they immediately started creating online cheese tasting parties where they would ship the cheese out and then have these, these great online events. So these are just two examples of how our creators pivoted and we made it our mission to really observe what, what they were doing and build a product experience that would allow them to do that faster, easier, and more effectively on the platform. And so that's been really one of the main shifts that we've made, which has been to support the growth of online events. And in total, over this period of time, online events have grown over 3,000% on the platform. And I think, again, that's a, a signal of the ubiquity of Eventbrite and live experiences and our focus on making it easier for creators to survive this time and really pivot their business model. Can you talk a little bit about how, like the biggest challenges that your clients have found as they're shifting events online? I mean, I know we have, you know, this was quite a hurdle just to put this event on and I'm interested in your experience. I think there's the obvious challenge, which is that being in person is really irreplaceable. There's an energy, there's a, you know, spontaneity, certainly with a conference, there are impromptu conversations that happen. And I think in, in, in order for us to um, think differently about the future, we sort of need to let go of the past, right? So um, there's a pent up demand to gather in person and that will happen in due time. But online events have given us a new totally unchartered opportunity of accessibility. So everyone is more available right now because for the most part, many people are still sheltering in place. And also you can access great content as a consumer more so than you could in pre-COVID. So there's been this distinct consumer behavior shift and creators have answered that behavior shift by creating new content and then also by you know, um, uh, creating a hybrid model uh, for their events. And so I think that, that when we you know, fast forward three years from now, I truly believe that we'll be um, maybe surprised by how much of our old life comes back. Uh, but I also think that the online events that have now gone from, you know, in-person hyper-local events to big global events will not go away. I have a great example of this in, in um, at the Prince County, Georgia, Prince George County Library uh, system. They created an event with the author Ibram X. Kendi to talk about his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. 
And what would have normally been an in-person event of maybe 100 people ended up registering over a quarter of a million people for this event. And so it's just a one data point of how something that used to be very hyper-local has gone global. And that, that expansion of audience is something that I don't think will go away. So do you think, what does that, I mean, what does that mean for, you mentioned three years from now, I mean, when do you think we'll start seeing live events come back and kind of which ones do you think will come back first? Well, as I tell the team, it's not our job to predict the future because clearly, you know, all of us are are somewhat uh, uh, ill-informed with the crystal ball maneuver, um, but it is our job to prepare for anything. So we look at data from places like New Zealand, which, you know, on, on uh, June 8th had had effectively declared COVID eradicated. And in the next four weeks, what we saw was a huge surge in in-person events, more so than we've ever seen. So growing year over year. We think that there that is a data point. And we think that, you know, not every country is identical to New Zealand and certainly not every country has handled the COVID containment as New Zealand has. But this gives us optimism to know that people are absolutely craving in-person connection. I mean, it's innate in our own desire to connect with one another, and it's an innate human experience. And so, you know, common sense would say that in-person events will be back when it's safe to do so. What we think will come back first are these hyper-local and more intimate events. So we're seeing, you know, average uh, event sizes of 20 you know, 25 in areas where, you know, the containment has been handled well. And these safety protocols that we've, you know, authored with the Chertoff group to really help our creator community get prepared for the future of social distance events is again, common sense. It's really relying on the community itself to be thoughtful about safety protocols, like hygiene, like wearing masks, like keeping, you know, socially distanced. And what we're trying to do is really help our creators understand what kinds of things do they need to be communicating to their attendees to be able to keep these events going. Because it really takes all of us to be able to get back out and enjoy live events. I think next year will be a great time for us to start seeing these safety protocols be used in such a way and a scale that, you know, it'll give a greater boost to live events. But certainly we're seeing in-person events come back all over the world in different ways, um, especially as the local regulations have allowed them to, to do so. So what does that mean for your business? What do you, what's your forecast for the next 12 months? Well, what we're focused on is how we can both strengthen our platform, create a much more superior product experience for our creators who are using the platform frequently and also help them reach a broader audience. So it's really getting back to the fundamentals. And I think that that's what's so important to a company like Eventbrite because we're going to be here when COVID is contained and when the global pandemic is in the rearview mirror. So it's not so much about survival, it's about what we're going to do with this time. And our time is focused on all the ways in which we can help our customers be stronger small businesses. We see, you know, most of our customers are professionals and small businesses. And that to us is a core part of our vision for the next three years is how do we help small businesses thrive? So we're looking at ways that we can help them create more frequent events. Um, why? Well, because we've seen event publishing go up 5x in our frequent creator segment, which is, you know, something that we think is, is both because of the online event opportunity, but also because event creators are seeing this pent up demand. So they're able to host more frequent events and gather, you know, attendees for each of those events. We're also looking at ways in which we can help them become more efficient marketers of their events, because as the reopening happens, there's, they're going to need help to rebuild their, their businesses and therefore rebuild the live experience economy. And then finally, I would say that we're focused on, on being a better company. You know, I think this time has really made a lot of companies look inward to who they are and what they've become and how they've weathered growth and scale. And certainly for us, as we're a smaller company now than we were in March, it's given us an opportunity to really dig deep 
and I think make some necessary improvements in who we are as a company, how we operate, and really set ourselves up for the future. So, I mean, I, you know, I feel like this, uh, the optimism I have is not sort of blind optimism. It's really rooted in the opportunity that we've had to reset some of the things that were broken and accelerate our ability to be a stronger scaled platform for anyone who's hosting an event. What would you say is an example of something that you fixed that was broken? Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot, there was a lot of friction in how money was moving on the platform. So, you know, when you think about a growth engine, that's, that's going at 150 miles per hour and all of a sudden it stops and needs to reverse, meaning many events are not going to happen. And therefore we're, we're refunding, right. More than, more than we're, we're selling tickets. I mean, that's, that is the brutal, harsh reality of a global pandemic and an events business. We made it just much more simple for event creators to not only communicate what their plans were for their event, but also be able to refund much, much more easily, which means a lot in the relationship between the creator and the ticket buyer. And then finally be able to offer credits for future events. Because one of the things that we determined early on is that there's a there's a unique relationship between an event creator on Eventbrite and their ticket buyer, because oftentimes these are small local community events. So the ticket buyer wants to see the event creator, whether it's a venue or a local community organizer, they want to see them survive this. And so being able to set up a, a you know, capability that we've never before had on the platform to allow creators to offer credits as an option um, in addition to refunds was a huge win for us and something that, you know, we were able to accelerate and ship out in record time. Can you talk a bit about the second half of the year, what you're expecting from a financial perspective? I mean, a lot of your clients are small businesses, which obviously have gotten hit pretty hard by this pandemic. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm interested in kind of what your outlook is. Sure. I'll give you all the financial details. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> You know, I think we've, I think we've done, a, I believe that we've done a really good job of bringing shareholders along on this journey and, you know, telling them uh, what we, what we're seeing and not getting too far over our skis of predicting what's going to happen. But I think that we'll continue to see recovery. I think it won't be a linear up into the right line though. It's going to be a pretty insane line as everything is feels this year. Um, Because, you know, as you've seen, even in the US, we take two steps forward and one step back. We're prepared for that, right? So our the creators that are are surviving and thriving on our platform, they're using different ways to keep their businesses relevant. And I think the future is going to look a lot like a hybrid model. I think you'll see online events continue to thrive. And I I think you'll see in-person events start to reemerge. And I think that Organizers of events will start to um, really uh, innovate with maybe a hybrid approach of having an online, a, a live event that's both online and in person. So we're excited to see that. I mean, again, our job is to really watch what they're doing and then build the product experience to make their lives easier and be able to make their experience more successful for everyone involved. In terms of the company, I mean, we know what we need to do, which is focus on building a stronger platform, a better product experience, and be able to drive more demand to the live events that are happening, as well as continue to reinforce our unique culture in a time when you know we're all at home. Um, and so that's what we'll be focused on in the back half of the year. And again, I think the way I, I tie that back to success is that the companies that are thriving through this are taking a more focused approach. They're strategically focusing on what's most important instead of trying to sort of, you know, widen the aperture and do do more during this time. I firmly believe that in, you know, five years, we'll look back and we'll say, you know, this moment was defining for companies like Eventbrite because they focused on what was most important and they didn't get distracted by sort of all the noise that's surrounding us right now. What would you say, just looking back at the past six months, has been the most challenging part of, you know, running the company during this time? I think the most challenging part has been not being in person with the team. For a company like Eventbrite, where we have such a strong culture, 
the in-person experience is really one of our unique attributes. So it's been really difficult being away from the team. The last time I saw a team member in person was in um, mid-March and I was the last person in the San Francisco office. I kind of felt like I needed to be the last, the last one to make sure everybody <laughs> was, was, you know, safely ensconced at home in their work from home environment. And, um, and you know, that's, that's been a really hard part of this experience. I think the second part is the great macro uncertainty. You know, there's just so much that we don't know yet in terms of how we'll ultimately contain the virus how our economy is going to react to all of the destruction that's happened, what's happening globally, how will we reinstill a, a sense of globalization in a time when a lot of countries have shut their borders. Um, that's been difficult because in the backdrop behind every day at Eventbrite, there's just this overwhelming sense of uncertainty. And I think that only time will, will really, you know, heal that uncertainty or make it make, you know, everybody feel a bit more stable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so many questions. So on that note, let's open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, let's see what they, thank you so much, Julia. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Julia. We are so happy that you have been able to join us today and take some questions from our audience. Uh, Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So uh, that we have quite a few. Um, I'd love to get a sense. So one question we have is, let's see. We have a whoa, We have quite a few questions. Um, it's crazy. Uh, okay. So I'm gonna let's start with Marissa's question. Uh, Obviously, there's challenges with companies moving live events to a virtual world, and you have so much content. I mean, I've learned that this week. Um, what are some of the ways you've seen companies deliver more creative virtual events and keep the audiences engaged? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, our event creators are really leading the way. So our job, you know, right now is to is to focus on what they're doing and finding out what works and helping make that process faster and easier and more intuitive through our product experience. One of the things that we've seen take off pretty quickly is this notion of um, combining the, the physical with the virtual world. And not only is it a surprise and delight moment when an event creator ships out a physical good, like with Murray's Cheese and the cheese tasting example, or Rockstar Beer Festival and the beer tasting example, or River North is doing a, a wine tasting event. Um, it, it actually increases attendance tremendously to that online event because you know, you're excited to be with other people who have the same physical good. And again, there's just this crossing over of physical to virtual that I think makes experiences quite meaningful. Another way that that folks are, um, you know, are, are making online events more, more um, engaging is by highlighting highlighting the global nature of the event. A great example of that is Daybreaker, which is one of my favorite events. They, prior to COVID, would be hosting events in major cities around the world. Um, there are early morning rave-like parties and yoga, meditation, and they've completely embraced this opportunity to be global. And I think they do a good job of showcasing the global attendees. They do this now every week. It's like Saturday service. Um, and I think that they've, you know, reached just a totally dynamic group of people and they do a good job of highlighting that. So it makes you feel more connected as an attendee to the rest of the people that you normally wouldn't be seeing in a live experience. Have you, I'm just interested, have you seen anything not work? That's something that tried to like go over that physical realm and didn't work as a like giveaway or something? Um, I think that uh, what came through my head is, yeah, that one time when they tried to ship live animals, no. Um, there is a, you know, I think that there is this kind of barrier to, to connectivity. So um, I think having too many people at an event trying to interact at the same time without creating different breakout room opportunities or smaller, more curated 
um, you know, dynamic conversations. I think the more savvy creators and certainly uh, the information is in, and, and Amy is just and you know, emblematic of the of the more savvy creators, uh, you know, they're they're getting a hang of how to create that intimacy when we are not actually in the same physical space. And so um, that's what we're seeing creators do, certainly in the format of conferences and seminars and workshops, is actually create more of a curated dialogue than. Uh, you know, everybody is is trying to chime in at the same time. Um, and I, I think that, you know, as we continue, I think online events are here to stay. We'll continue to, you know, enjoy this way of, ex of experiencing live events together um, because it's opened up this whole world of accessibility and of finding other people who have your shared interests or passion all over the world, much like social media, you know, has created that pathway for us. But I do think that nothing will replace the in-person event. And so I think that there will be a, a broader adoption of online, but also in-person events are going to come back. And even those are going to look a little bit different, too. Yeah. Well, do you want to talk about that? How do you see those looking different going forward? Well, gosh, we're already seeing it. So, you know, in places like New Zealand, where in-person events are now growing year over year on our platform because they've done a really good job of, of containing COVID. And, you know, I think their, their public health guidelines and the way that they've adhered to them have allowed their citizens to really be able to move much more freely. We're seeing um, you know, much smaller events because even though they can they can move about freely, they're also taking into account the importance of social distancing and of things like you know staggered entry to events. Um, one of my favorite examples from stateside is actually um, Kate Levenstein, who founded Cannonball Productions, and she is the creator of the Beer and Bacon Festival. And during COVID, she came up with a new idea for this type of event um, that's called Seltzer Land. And it's a hard seltzer tasting event where you come with your group to a golf course and you travel the course to all the different stations where there are different, you know, um, hard seltzer drinks. And um, you can really experience it out in the open, but in a really, really safe way. I think she is a, a, one of the pioneers of, you know, the new format of festivals. The final thing I'll say is that drive-ins are having a massive comeback. So, you know, being able to go to um, a drive-in in a in a car with your group and stay socially distanced and wa either watch a movie or a show or concerts. There have even been church services. Um, so, you know, I, time and time again, uh, we just continue to prove to ourselves as humans that we can adapt to anything. And we're seeing the ingenuity of our creators really capture this consumer behavior shift in the moment not only to keep their small businesses alive, but to actually grow new business opportunity into the future. Uh, Victoria has a question about, can you talk about how you work with your event producers, especially since there's so many choices for platforms to host live events? Yeah, so we focus on how we can make an event creator successful by offering them a product that is intuitive, easy to use, and self-service. You know, we're only doing our job if an event creator can come to the platform, set up their event listing, promote their event, sell tickets, and be able to, to analyze the results afterwards in a really self-service, easy to use way. I think we have a lot of work to do. And our roadmap into the future is really focused on building the strongest platform for any event creator who is hosting a live experience, whether it's in person or online, as well as, as offering them of just a product experience that keeps getting better and better. Then on top of that, the way that we build community with our event creators, because those are the people that we obsess over, um, is through content. So we produce some of, I think, the largest library of proprietary content around producing events, especially for our market, our mid-market of, of events. And we also are building ways in which event creators can start connecting with one another in more friction-free ways. Because over the years, we found that every time we get event creators into a room, there are these lifelong friendships that get, you know, they, that get struck up and there's just so much knowledge sharing. So we want to build a stronger way for our community to be able to make themselves stronger and help each other rebuild the live experience economy. Our mission is to be that platform to enable them, but we certainly are the ones supporting their ingenuity, their creativity, their innovation. 
Uh, we have a question from Vivian who's asking, what type of support do you provide to the organizers? Can you explain in broad terms the structure of the arrangements with the organizers? Yeah, so Eventbrite is predominantly self, what we call self sign on. So 98% of our event creators come to Eventbrite and they come through the front door on their own. A small percentage of our event creators, we strike a relationship that's, you know, accustomed to it's an inside sales mechanism that we have at Eventbrite where we go out and we find what we think are great matches for the platform um, and the product. And then we offer them thought leadership. We offer them onboarding training and service to be able to be successful. Because I think that you know, Eventbrite is, is at its best when it is being fully maximized. And, you know, sometimes when you're creating, bringing an event from offline to online, which is certainly um, you know, a lot of the trend that we're seeing right now, you need that extra sort of um, that extra moment of inspiration, be it from the community or from our own content or our team to get started. And so we're really focused on how can we make that onboarding experience the very best it could be so that you can continue to get back to the other things that you have to do as an event producer. I mean, again, I, you know, the list is lengthy and the stakes are high. And we feel that during COVID, especially, we need to do everything we can to rally behind event creators who are now having to adapt and pivot their model to fit a new normal that will be around for quite some time. This isn't just a temporary condition. Um, we have another question about from Kate Warren. How are you seeing attendee engagement as we're now six months into this new reality? Is there a fatigue from online events? I would have thought by now that all of us would have shut our laptops and just started staring at a wall. I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but I get screen burnout uh, by the end of the day. We are seeing the exact opposite. So we recently surveyed. So online events are up 3000 percent on the platform year over year. We're seeing, um, you know, we recently ran a survey and 60% of consumers we surveyed said that they had attended at least five events, online events in the last month. And about half of them said that when in-person events come back, they'll continue to, to attend online events in addition to in-person events. And then on the willingness to pay side, what was really interesting is just about half of our, of our um, surveyed respondents said that they think that a price tag between $10 to $30 per ticket is reasonable for an online event. So this is really, these, these aren't just free events. These are, you know, paid events, opportunity for event creators to generate revenue and build a bigger audience. And on the bigger audience front, you know, some of these, the free events that have been hosted on Eventbrite lately are astounding. Uh, one of my favorite examples is the Prince George's Library that hosted a talk with Ibram X. Kendi, the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, and they registered over a quarter of a million people for that talk. So what would have normally been about 150 people, you know, exploded into this global audience. And I think those opportunities are unique to COVID, and it's something that we see people taking advantage of. Uh, Olivia has a great question. How have you maintained a positive culture in this crazy time, especially given all the layoffs? I mean, you know, the last six months have been incredibly difficult. And I feel that every week of this experience has you know, served up a new challenge for leaders. It's a really difficult time to be leading. I mean, I don't think anybody who is leading a team or leading a company or leading their family uh, has ever experienced this before. We're all in, in somewhat of uncharted territory with this global pandemic and all of the challenges that have presented themselves all at the same time in this year. Um, so I think, you know, it's a sensitive time to be leading. It's also an important time. And what I find um, works for me and, you know, is, is certainly having a positive impact on our company is to focus on the opportunity. Um, you know, in every threat or, or um, you know, barrier, I think there's a, either a silver lining or an opportunity or a lesson learned. And so we focus on that. We also focus on being pragmatic about this time being extraordinarily difficult for everyone. You know, going back into school um, season without our kids going physically to school is just another stressor on parents within the company. But whether you're a parent or a caregiver 
or you're just taking care of yourself and trying to keep yourself sane, this is a time that's just extra taxing. So we're being mindful of that and we're talking about it openly and we're not trying to, you know, kind of sweep the hard stuff under the rug. So every day is a challenge, but I think that what's you know, struck me as, as incredibly unique is just how um, the Brightlings, our, our company uh, employees have looked out for one another and have been really steadfast in their passion around our customers, which is, I think, given us this really meaningful focus to sort of distract us from what's going on outside sometimes. Uh, we just have one minute left, but I did want to get to this question. Patty is curious about what you think will happen with big conferences like CES and Dreamforce, which have been, become such mainstays for the tech industry. Do you think that once there's a vaccine, there's going to be an appetite? Like, have you done any research about, you know, the appetite for big conferences? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, in three years from now, we'll be surprised at how similar our life looks like to what it looked like pre-COVID. I think that some things will fundamentally change. Certainly, innovation will have accelerated. But I think there's going to be some really big elements of familiarity. And I think that's it will take potentially the entire three years to get there for big conferences. I think smaller, hyper-local, more controllable events that are intimate where you can, you know, really implement safety protocol, those are going to be the first to come back. And that's why we've produced a safety playbook for our event creators, because those are the types of events that they're typically producing. Bigger format events are going to be more expensive to produce safely. And so I think that that plus, plus the willingness to attend a large crowd event it's going to take some time, but we'll get there. I mean, CES, for if as the example, that community is founded on something that is truly passionate. And so you got to believe in the power of community and sticking together. And I mean, again, I'm an optimist on this by by trade and by nature. And I think that, you know, we will be gathering um, as we did before within three years. OK, great. On that note, Julia, thank you again for joining us. I really appreciate it. Have a great thank one. Thank you. At Intuit, we believe you cannot have prosperity without equality. Women and people of color should not be paid less than men for the same work. Three years ago, we made a commitment to reach and maintain pay equity for our employees. But pay equity is an ongoing process and all companies must join this fight like the 19th Amendment, we are not done.